I'm Chris Harwood, and so I, I'm wearing two hats. I am uh, the lecturer in Czech at Columbia University, but I'm also the president of the New York chapter of the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences, which is one of the three entities uh, co-sponsoring uh, this event, along with the Czech Center and the Consulate General of the Czech Republic uh, uh, here in New York. Uh, and so I think all of us have really been looking forward to this program. I know I am. Uh, some of you know that in a previous life, I was a Russian studies person. So this, this program is of, and, and now I'm a Czech studies person, obviously. So it's a, of special interest to me. Josef uh, Pazderka is a Czech historian and journalist. And of course, uh, the author of the film uh, that we'll be seeing and the book that goes along with the film that uh, he'll be presenting. He studied history at the Faculty of Arts of Charles University in Prague and then development studies at the Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom. Uh, he has worked for People in Need, Človek v Tisni, the uh, Czech Relief Aid and Developmental Assistance Organization. Then in 2005, he joined uh, Czech Television and then became its uh, primary Moscow correspondent from 2006 to 2010. And I believe that's when he did most of the research in connection with uh, the film and the book. Uh, subsequently, he was in Warsaw uh, for Czech television as a correspondent from 2012 to 2016. And since then, uh, he has been working for the online weekly Aktualnie Tečka CZ, uh, and is now that, uh, that publication's editor-in-chief. Uh, he has authored numerous publications focusing on Russia, Ukraine, and the uh, East Central European region. So uh, he will be here uh, uh, after the film to answer uh, all of your questions. And along with him will be Milan Babik, uh, who was born in Schumperk and uh, first came to the United States in 1995, but before he did, I met him in Prague <laughs> because I was working for the Foundation for a Civil Society in New York, uh, well, New York, Prague, that, uh, that arranged uh, the scholarship that allowed him to attend a boarding school in Massachusetts. Uh, since then, he has gone on to study at uh, Colby College in Maine, London School of Economics, McGill University, and uh, then at University of Oxford, where he completed his doctorate in international relations in 2009. Uh, he has published several books and articles on international relations theory, U.S. foreign policy, and diplomatic history. Uh, he now lives uh, at, uh, with his two small children on the coast of Maine and is teaching uh, as a visiting professor at his alma mater, Colby College. So he'll be here to engage in a conversation with, uh, with Joseph and myself after the film. So please enjoy the film. Two important things. Uh, it's in Czech with the uh, English subtitles. Uh, there's one important uh, thing omitted in uh, at one sequence of the of the subtitles. Uh, it's when Natalia Gorbanevska, the Soviet dissident, uh, talks about the drugs that were forced on her when she was forcibly detained at the psychiatric hospital. The uh, the drug is called haloperidol. You will understand it in Czech, but it's not in the subtitles. And secondly, there is very little part of the film that was uh, uh, made of the original footage by General Kosenko. The quality is quite low, so we do apologize for this fragment that is, uh, the quality is low, but I hope you will enjoy it, and I look forward to the discussion after the film. Thank you. Okay, um, a lot of food for thought there. I think before uh, we get into some of the historical questions of why, maybe, Josef, you could just give us a little background on uh, the creation of the film, what, what got you started on it, uh, how you put the material together. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, the documentary was made in 2011, so it's uh, already eight <clears throat> years old. Uh, uh, most of it is based on the re uh, interviews that I recorded in uh, 2008, in 2009 in Moscow. Uh, sadly, I see m many people of that time now uh, dying. Uh, Natalia Gorbanevska is dead. Uh, uh, Pavel Kosenko, the general who never ever came, came to terms to what he was part of, uh, also died in 2013. Arseniy Roginsky, sadly, one of the founders of Memorial Society, is, is dead as, as well. I was a journalist. I was Czech TV correspondent <clears throat> in Moscow. I was educated as a, as a historian. So I was very curious uh, 
what the Russians coming on the tanks to Prague, what did they think, you know, when they were sent there? Well, could they know? Uh, and once they realized that the, that, that the reality is different, uh, whether they were able to come to terms or what they were part of. Uh, and as you could see in the film, some of they did, uh, and some of they didn't. Uh, but what was really striking for me and was mo most powerful was the meeting of the Soviet dissidents, uh, especially Natalia Gorbanevska, as you could uh, hear her testimony from the Manta Clinic that was, she, she, she detained. It was uh, it's such a horrible experience. Uh, and I was surprised uh, uh, that most of the Czechs and Slovaks, even back home, they were not aware of that. They didn't know that there was Russians uh, <clears throat> protesting against the uh, uh, Soviet invasion. So it was very important, not only for me, but also for other people within, uh, uh, made on not, not only the documentary, but also this book that was published in English this year. Uh, and it's made of testimonies, made of uh, uh, you know research and so on, showing the hopes that the Russians pinned on the on the uh, Prague Spring that were finally crashed in August 1968. So it's mainly mainly this background. If if I may chime in, um, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about Josef's documentary and the book also, just how much uh, attention it pays to the flow of information, and the use of information uh, spin as we would call it nowadays, uh, in justifying political violence, acts of, um, um, of politics, uh, invasion, and so on and so forth. This is something that uh, we have to deal with today, but I see the beginnings of that already uh, in the 60s and perhaps, uh, perhaps even earlier. Uh, certainly. I think it's a, a great service that, that your, uh, your work has done here, for Czechs especially, as you say, we're completely unaware, and it, it's very understandable for historical reasons why uh, citizens of Czechoslovakia or the former Czechoslovakia may have a kind of um, just sort of uh, gut level aversion to everything that comes from the East. And I think it this, that uh, the film and the book let us know that it was more complicated than that. Uh, granted, it was not a mass movement, the dissident movement, but it does show you that there was this level of society in Russia uh, for whom those events had a very different meaning and who would have done differently if they could have. As you pointed out, it's it's been eight years since you made the film, and uh, Russia has continued to develop. Uh, I wonder if um, you've had a chance to revisit these questions, uh, either with the people you interviewed for the film, or, or um, uh, with other Russians who you've met, or whether you've been able to follow uh, the way subsequent uh, public proclamations in Russia about history have reflected these events, or if you have any observation about how the uh, current regime in Russia has has glossed this historical moment. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's quite a sad story for me because I obviously met the people who are featured in this uh, documentary and in, in the book uh, uh, quite recently, and I see the situation in Russia, the, ad the overall atmosphere coming back to the Soviet past. It's not, uh, well, Russia, current Russia is obviously not uh, the Soviet Union, but the authoritarian tendencies and ag again, uh, glorifying of the Soviet past is really, uh, is really coming, coming back. Uh, there's a uh, new big uh, you know two hour documentary made on uh, Prague Spring uh, it was made in 2015 it's called Warszawski Dogor Rasekrechine Stranitsi and it basically repeats the old line of the Soviet propaganda brotherly help uh, stopping the third world war naive uh, Czechs and Slovaks uh, that were manipulated by the West not knowing what they were part of uh, and we just had to help that and, uh, and I think uh, Part of it is also uh, uh, that the situation in Ukraine, the Ukrainian crisis, really raised this level of Soviet propaganda. I'm pretty sure, sadly, that most of the interviews that we did in 2008, uh, 9 wouldn't be possible now because people were then quite open. They were at least trying to t come to terms to what was uh, the reality they were part of. Uh, now it's been, this road has been closed. The Prague Spring is not the only sort of crossroads in the Russian slash Soviet history, by the way. There are other key events. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, 
And I'm just going to say that that pact has also been undergoing sli slight sort of revisions, re sort of reinterpretations and so on. And there has been quite a bit of pushback um, in Central Europe against those. Uh, Daniela Kolonovska, uh, who's at the Czech Academy of Sciences, works uh, as a historian, has done a lot of work, research in Russian archives. Basically, recently, uh, um, at the end of August, uh, wrote uh, an op-ed piece in Lidova Novini, where she warned against this sort of revisionism, uh, and also drew attention to the involvement of um, uh, the Russian military and intelligence community uh, in uh, these uh, the, the process of fabrication of these historical narratives. Uh, I think that's something that that needs to be flagged, certainly. And uh, I would just add briefly that you know uh, that. The, the, the problem is that it's fluid, you know, that the Russian attitude has uh, many features. On, on one hand, you have the official line where they, uh, even Putin condemned the, the, the invasion, you know, they say, okay, uh, it was not right. But when you see this documentary that I've mentioned coming out in 2015, two hours uh, being aired to tens of millions of people, you just understand how it works, you know. You have the official line, but you feed the audience uh, with something else, uh, as Milan mentioned, you know, uh, invasion to Prague is not the crucial event of the Soviet past. It's a big terror, you know, Afghanistan, uh, Hungary, whatever. But this only shows, you know, this uh, very fluid uh, uh, approach towards the history. If you need Molotov Ribbentrop, mm -hmm. it was just, uh, you know, a necessary step to protect the Soviet Union. If you need to apologize, you apologize and you don't, you don't have a problem. Strategic brilliance, uh, as it was called, uh, the need to create a buffer out of Ukraine, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, Eastern Poland, to protect Belarus and Ukraine. That's the narrative here uh, uh, in Putin's sort of interpretation of, of Molotov-Ribbentrop. Once again, sort of pushing against Gorbachev's narrative, which was essentially to renounce that pact in its entirety and, and, and apologize for it. Do you... Either of you see the, the main purpose in this kind of uh, retelling of history? Is it, is it more to justify potential Russian steps in foreign policy? Or is it more a matter of just uh, restoring a Russian sense of okayness with the historical past and the Soviet past and its greatness? You know, coming to terms to your own past, uh, when it that, that there was a violent, there was a bloodshed, uh, is not easy anywhere. You know, uh, the Czechs and Slovaks they don't like revisit uh, their history once there are some you know bloody stains and so on. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say that the Russians are an exception. Uh, Germans were forced, you know, to denazify, and it took them you know decades and so on. Uh, the sad thing is uh, that. There is really no will to revisit the Soviet past uh, and be frank. You know, one of the saddest things that I have experienced was uh, when this book was uh, uh, translated into Russian. I think it was 2015 or 16. And I went uh, for the screening and, and for the book to be launched to St. Petersburg and then, then to Moscow. And I met m many people who, f who were featured in this film. And I could see that the Memorial Society, the historic society that really you know, wants to show what happened in, in the Soviet past, uh, is now be becoming again a, a dissident movement. You know, they are oppressed, uh, they are isolated. I would, uh, you know, we would do a screening in Moscow in, in a hall like this, m maybe twice uh, a large, uh, but you could see old friends, you could see very emotional people. It was great to meet them, but you could see that they have no influence on the society at all. So this is one of the saddest thing that uh, really comes to my mind. I think there is also a sort of a sociological and demographic component uh, to the sprucing up or reviving of these narratives making grandchildren proud uh, of their grandparents. Um, um, I've heard that argument. And I also believe that, you know, this is part of Russian power. Uh, the great uh, English historian E.H. Carr, who knew a lot about Russia uh, and the Soviet Union, basically said there are three kinds of power in international politics, military, economic, uh, and power over opinion or ideological power. Uh, and, and this historical narrative, uh, this emphasis on a certain interpretation of the past, official interpretation of the past, I read as a projection of ideological power at a time when Russia might still not have as much military and economic power as it would like to have. Um, 
Yeah, uh, just a bit in addition. For me, this book and, and, and the, the film was also very important to, uh, to to cross this line between this uh, black and white thinking, you know, the Czechs uh, uh, and Slovaks where the victims and the Russians were to blame, are clearly distinguished between the Soviet Union and Russia, you know. I wanted to show also very small number of Russians uh, who opposed, you know, and then uh, paid um, uh, enormous price for their protest uh, and to show that we are all, you know, Central and Eastern Europeans, uh, those nations who are under the Soviet rule, we are all united in, uh, and we have to come to terms with what happened and take part, uh, uh, take the responsibility to, to uh, what we were part of. So uh, that was something very important for me. Yeah, yeah I know that uh, this topic uh, is pretty important to a lot of people in the audience, so I would like to open it up to questions from the floor. In the political context we have in the whole world today, uh, and in the context of everything you mentioned about preserving those memories, I see the role of countries like Czechia, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Afghanistan, and others who have been through these nightmares is absolutely crucial not just to preserve a memory, but my question to all of you is, are there programs, are there ideas? How do you convey this to the younger generations? Because they have to discuss, to analyze, otherwise you're not going to prevent this again. And even the discussion of the invader is so important because in Russia, as you say, it cannot be discussed any longer. It was for a very short period of time. But what do, do children in school or teenagers learn about those things? Is this film going to be accessible for teenagers? How is the, the, uh, the growing generation dealing with having this role not only to preserve the memory, but also to prevent this from happening again in the future. Yeah. I just want to mention Judith was one of the translators uh, for the book. Uh, she made an excellent translation for half of this book. So I want to uh, thank her very much. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as the question is concerned, uh, I think, uh, you know, we do whatever is possible. I think, uh, you know, Czechs and Slovaks and, and the other nations uh, uh, in the center of Europe, I think they are really trying to come to terms and to convey this message also to the uh, younger generation. I was really surprised when we screened this uh, film in 2011, uh, there was quite a, you know, big interest uh, also among the younger generation. So it's our part, uh, our turn, uh, to convey the message in the language that is un understandable um, to younger people. But I'm worried about Russia, really, you know. Uh, and again, it's not the question about, uh, of only, you know, Prague Spring or the Soviet intervention. It's just about, you know, forgetting uh, uh, about the victims of the big terror, about Stalinism, trying again to portray Stalin as a big leader, you know, who won the Second World War. I think it's uh, it has to do with uh, with the tendencies that Milan pointed out. Uh, it's just this um, you know this thirst for big nation for superpower once again. Uh, it's and it's misleading people and 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 I'm worried that, that that it's intentional really. To that, I'm just going to add that my background, uh, my context is. Uh, is slightly different from Josef's. I teach here in the United States and I teach undergraduates. Uh, and frankly, I have to say that the level of historical literacy is abysmally low. Uh, to the point that teaching history has almost become a political act. Um, in the sense that, you know, as, as the great Czech French, French, he would call himself French writer, Milan Kundera said, you know, the, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, some of us choose not to go into politics, but go into teaching for that reason. The invasion is still happening with Ukraine. There you go, right? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, 
I was a reporter for Czech television during the Ukrainian crisis, I, and I went out to most of the places in in Ukraine, in Kiev Maidan, and then Crimea, and 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 Donbas, uh, and it really struck me the line from this film, you know, uh, a naive, disorientated nation that has to be, you know, saved uh, and so on. It, it was the line that I felt uh, in Ukraine once again. You know, Moscow was intervening, trying to hide the intervention. But again, you know, uh, from the Russian TVs and so on, this narrative was, a, again, reborn. You know, we have to save them. They're so naive. They are manipulated by the West. Uh, so... This tendency I find particularly dangerous. That the, you know that the the ghosts of the Soviet past are not buried, but then you know uh, reinforced once again. Can I ask you a question? What was the meaning to make this movie? The meaning was to transmit the story that I that I felt was important. You know, for me it was really important to show the the view from the Russian side. I think the intention of, of some people are pretty clear, you know, to glorify the Soviet past uh, and to hide the, the, the culprits and so on. And there are other people, uh, you know, again, Russians as well, who are trying to show this, but they are very isolated. And I think they really deserve our support. I think uh, supporting Memorial Society is extremely, extremely important at this time because these people are very few and they are under you know, very big attack. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank you for it. was an unbelievable, the juxtaposition of the, of the documentary footage while the, the, the juxtaposition of the, of the documentary footage with the narrative was just so undeniable. You, uh, you couldn't do this if you did a feature it wouldn't be the same impact. I mean, it would be wonderful because you might have a bigger audience, but to see the actual footage of those tanks completely surrounded. It, and, and the other thing that I wanted to say is that it's not just an Eastern European problem because Tiananmen Square in China is the same exact story. So it's a worldwide problem that humanity has to address. If I may, um, it may be useful to at this point distinguish between history and the past uh, uh, and those two are not the same. History is always, it involves selection. Uh, it, has, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, some acts, uh, some, some information is always selected uh, and included in the narrative. Some information is always uh, is omitted. And I just want to say, uh, as, as Igor Lukas, uh, who teaches history at Boston University, told me last week, uh, there would be a way to narrate the Prague Spring differently. For instance, by focusing on all the people who, uh, on the morning of the invasion, went to see the movie Cleopatra, uh, which was being screened underneath Venceslas Square, and they didn't care the least bit about the tanks and so on and so forth. And that portrayal would be a lot less heroic, uh, and we might even come to think of some of us Czechs as rather cold and, and sort of having a stake in the invasion and being culprits. The, the distinction between the perpetrator and the victim would, would become quite a bit more relative. And one of the things that I enjoy about Josef's documentary is the subtlety in portraying essentially the colliding obligations, uh, uh, whether it's, it's the, the Russian slash Soviet uh, actors or, or Czech. I mean, uh, uh, you know, to take a baby uh, into, uh, into the Red Square, uh, was it three years of age? Uh, three years of age. Three Sorry, three months. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, if you know, we 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 are watching this in a certain certain context. But if this was a, you know a plenary session on child developmental psychology, we would have a different reading of of uh, was it Gorbanska? Gorbanevska. right? Um, so just just to sort of understand that history and the past are not the same, and history involves selection, uh, uh, narrative, uh, putting things together in a certain way, leaving cer certain things out of the narrative and so on. Uh, do you have any, or did you, I'm not sure whether you sort of address this, but in terms of high school and history, what is going on with that in terms of understanding currently, not just history as it was, but 
history as it's occurring and relative to things in the past and how do we learn? And is any of that addressed or is it just standard history like I had back when? <laughs> Very back when. I, I, I'm afraid I have nothing nice to say oh, say about anything the way else. history is taught here, or rather yeah. not taught. Yeah, uh, and once again, I deal with a group of people who are supposed to be high achieving, sort of elite undergraduates yeah. uh, and so on. Um, they know next to nothing about the Cold War in general, let alone sort of events like 1968, 1956. Uh, I, I, I gave a midterm exam this past spring uh, uh, and one of the questions was about the Cold War and the response was, I don't know, I suppose it took place in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it truly is uh, um, um, discouraging. I just, I mean, uh, if, if that's probably a fair answer for the American side. If, if we want to talk about the Czech side, I just wanted to say that um, in addition to films like this, uh, there's a number of, I think, very good initiatives that have been taken uh, on the Czech side to help educate young people about the totalitarian past, and especially the work of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, which has really reached out uh, to young people uh, through online materials, even supporting the development of video games that deal with elements uh, from Czech history. Uh, they're not going to reach everyone, but I think there are a lot of people who work on these historical questions at a very high level who are also very aware of the need to uh, pass on uh, the, this kind of history uh, to, to young people. Yeah. And I just want to mention that the, that the Institute for, for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes uh, was also part, uh, uh, you know, supported this uh, publication. I want to mention one, one initiative, it's non for profit organization, Memory of the Nation, Pamnit Naroda, and they also pick up, uh, you know, stories, uh, just human stories, faces, you know, and then and, and many young people uh, react uh, with a great interest. Uh, I think it's very, very important to show the real heroes like Gorbanevska and, and, and the others uh, and let people feel, you know, the emotions around it. I think it really helps. Uh, I especially like that you, that you included the, uh, the story about the eight valiant or eight brave uh, because that's basically what what uh, I uh, from what I know is not that known among for instance my, my generation uh, well, of course we know all about uh, the Prague Spring in 1968 but this particular story not that much and last year actually when we uh, commemorated 50 years anniversary uh, I was very uh, glad and I'm sure that you shared that the, that the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, awarded the, the entire group of these eight valiant uh, of uh, the Gracias Agit Award, the highest award uh, awarded by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And there is, a, there is a link actually to New York, which I'm not sure if everyone is aware of. Two of these eight uh, valiants actually live in New York and New Jersey, not far from here. I was lucky enough you know, to accommodate their travels to, to, to Prague uh, a year ago. Uh, I sent them an invitation uh, for this evening. Uh, I don't see them here. Unfortunately, they probably weren't able to come. And uh, just a small uh, bittersweet comment uh, when uh, I was uh, asked to, to pro purchase a plane ticket for them last year for the ceremony. Uh, I was pushed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the cheapest flight, and the cheapest flight was with Aeroflot through Moscow. <laughs> and it took me kind of a convincing, you know, uh, to, to choose a, not the cheapest connection. So just, <laughs> so thank you again. Nora. Well, one of the many wonderful things that this movie does, uh, I think, is to also bring it beyond the bilateral angle of Soviet on Czech violence and point out that this invasion took place with the participation of other Warsaw Pact armies and irony of ironies took off from German soil from the former GDR crossing into uh, Bohemia and I I'm wondering um, this is a question to the filmmaker I guess how this absurd historical contortion was perceived by your interview partners. How did this impact their idea of, well, what they said about World War II, for example? You know, for me, uh, I'm not pretending, you know, I will tell the whole story. You know, it was obviously a selection. My perspective was Moscow, you know. I was based in Moscow. I could speak to the Russians uh, who were somehow uh, involved in these activities. 
Oh, of course, and I was trying to point out that, that they were not the only ones, but Moscow was definitely the leading force behind it, uh, and all the decisions were made there. Uh, we know a lot about the pressure that was put by the Polish or Eastern German leadership uh, on Moscow to stop Prague Spring. There was clearly involvement of other forces, but the uh, Soviet soldiers were the most, were the most numerous, uh, and for me, it, it was really important to show... This I called it in the foreword to, to this book uh, a psychogram. You know, uh, it was not a, only about the uh, historical lectures about the studies and so on. There are wonderful reflections of Russian historians what the uh, Soviet emb embassy in Prague did to be prior to the uh, intervention, what the KGB was uh, was doing, how they provoked and so on. But for me, meeting the real people and trying to understand uh, how they reflected on the events. Uh, you know, 50 years ago was really the most important thing, and that's what I—that's the message that I, that I was trying to convey. Yeah. That was it. Well, I'm, I'm completely sympathetic with your opinion and your emotions and so forth, but I think we have to remember that uh, this country also invaded other countries. In 1965, we invaded the Dominican Republic, and in uh, some years later, with the Reagan uh, years, we invaded Grenada. And then uh, with the Bush, we invaded Iraq. And now there's, uh, there's rethinking about the 1967 Israeli invasion of uh, the Sinai that was uh, okayed by the US. They came, uh, th there's all, a lot of revision uh, history there where the Israelis came to the Washington and said, can we do this? And Washington said, finally, yes. That was because we wanted the Russians to get out of the Middle East. So it's a question also of, of big power. The big powers do things like that. It's not just the Russians. It's other big powers as well. And you can see that also in Libya, where the Europeans decided to get rid of Gaddafi. <laughs> and, and was there a question? Of, cor of, course, of course they do it. Yeah. I, I did notice a, a subtext of uh, finger pointing among uh, the Russians. Uh, used in their, uh, oh, the East Germans did it, or we didn't kill. Uh, is that uh, pretty common in, in, their, re, in their memories of, uh, of trying to cleanse their guilt? Look, th this is one of the, um, you know, very interesting parts of this story, because uh, uh, the memories uh, of the Soviet uh, soldiers are very selective, you know. Uh, and I think, pointing out, actually, Eastern Germans were not involved in the invasion, though Eastern Germany declared that th th there were no Eastern German soldiers actually on the on the Czech Czechoslovak soil. But though uh, he still blames the you know the shooting at the Eastern Germans. Uh, uh, once you go through the memories of different Soviet uh, Soviet soldiers, you could find a f you know really phantasmagorical stories. Uh, there's a testimony one of the. Generals, I forgot the name. He is now living in Ukraine. He, um, you know, he writes in his memories. Uh, they went out to the uh, center committee building in Prague, and they uh, they saw, you know, bodies uh, with blood and so on. It's nonsense. There's, there was nothing like that. The same as General Kosenko claimed that the, there were people shooting at them uh, on Wenceslav Square, but. Uh, you know, as as as, as Kos Kosenka was concerned, he was when I met him in two thousand eight or, or nine, he was someone who was very frank, and he met me as a youngster who doesn't know anything. He just wanted to explain to me, you know. And when I brought up the facts, he didn't want to listen. You know, he just uh, you know there are certain facts. You you cannot just say there were people shooting where there were no guns and none none of that. He wouldn't be persuaded, you know, just made it his mind. I'll, I'll just add once again, this is a feature of statecraft. Uh, we all remember uh, uh, Colin Powell's presentation uh, to the UN Assembly with the yellow cake uranium, uh, uh, which Joe Wilson, Ambassador Joe Wilson, in his uh, uh, OPET piece later on uh, essentially undermined, said, I did not find any yellow cake uranium uh, uh, procured by Iraq. Uh, this, this, this sort of fabrication. Uh, is, is, is quite common. Uh, when there is a need to essentially fabricate legitimacy for 
for certain uh, political acts uh, yeah. and so on. But for me, just one point to the, the gentleman that meant uh, that the US was also in, involved in the invasion. Uh, that's right. Uh, it's, it's it's sadly you know the politics of, of superpowers. But I still see the difference uh, between uh, a totally totalitarian regime uh, and then uh, between the country that is not a, at least you know trying to come to terms with its past. You know, Russia is not Soviet Union, but it's not a country where you know free research can be pursued, where there, there's no, uh, th there are no media that can you know, uh, convey the message to the general public. And that's the difference. You live in, in a free country. I know uh, that the US has you know, numerous problems, uh, and I don't, don't want to diminish it, but it still is a free country where you can gather and where you can discuss it and when you say uh, when you can say openly you know we were not right you know we invaded try it in the russia you know you would be detained you know so on yeah. well thank you very much for the wonderful movie um i wonder if either of you would like to say something about how the memory of these events was uh, preserved uh in the soviet union uh, over a long period of time, and not by the main, not not by the not by the main actors, but by uh, people in the population. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in March uh, 1990, I was uh, in Uzhgorod, in western Ukraine, uh, and I w met young university students at that time. And Uzhgorod is a beautiful city with beautiful uh, cobblestone streets. The young students want to show me that the cobblestones on a certain curb were pushed down flat into the street. And they said, we leave them this way because this is where the tanks went through in the invasion of Czechoslovakia. And so the citizens of this city had kept the damage in place so that people would remember this. He also said, and these kids were, these people were 20 years old, so they were <laughs> not alive during the uh, invasion. So this is a memory that has been passed on to them by their elders. He also said that everyone said they thought it was World War III because they had no idea what it was and why these tanks were coming through their town. So I think there's another story to be told about the preservation of memory uh, in more ordinary circumstances in, in the Soviet Union. That was in 1990. Yeah. I was quite lucky to join uh, uh, Pavel Litvinov, who was mentioned. He was one of the this uh, eight uh, who went out uh, uh, on uh, 25th of August, uh, 68, to the Red Square, and and I joined him and then some other people and many you know young Russians to go on a Red Square last summer, and it was particularly touching on one hand, you know, to see these people coming out, and it was really troubling to see that they went out. Once they shown the historical banner they had uh, on 25th of 68, they were again detained by the police. They were fined. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a nephew of, uh, of Natalia Gorbanevska was detained, fined uh, heavily and so on. So it, this is a worrying trend, really. You know, uh, This is something that we have to take care of. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no people in Russia you know, trying to convey the historical memorial. Again, you know, Memorial Society, there are many researchers. There are wonderful researchers in this book. You know, they... they They'd studied the the role of the Soviet uh, propaganda, Soviet uh, embassy, you know, KGB, into very thin detail, and they they uh, describe it uh, very openly and very frankly. But sadly, they are very very little, and they are very very isolated, and that, that, that that's I think that really deserves our intention, uh, attention. You know, I'll just add that freedom of speech is absolutely critical to preserving the alternative narratives, sort of non-official. Uh, and once again, I'm, I'm coming at this from the background of the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, the 80th anniversary of that, uh, because they're the memorial society involved in Russia uh, in essentially producing a volume about that pact. Uh, uh, the, the chairman uh, of, of that memorial society was an intelligence, or is an intelligence officer. Uh, so it's essentially, it's you know, historical research 
has become an extension of, uh, of state power uh, in that regard. Well, there are people who think that democracy will just always be here. It'll just be here. So it doesn't matter what we do in our country. It'll just be here. And I'm thinking, wow, they really think that. Uh, that's the message of the you know 30th anniversary of uh, Velvet Revolution. That's the message of this book, uh, of this film. Democracy is not for granted. We really have to take care of it and we have to defend it, you know. And, and there are people, wonderful people in the past, uh, who did defend it, even being detained, being imprisoned, uh, being treated badly at the psychiatric clinic. Uh, it's a, you know, great honor that we could, uh, you know, remember them and, and we have to take part in, in this struggle. It's not, it's not for granted, really. this wonderful discussion. I'd like to uh, thank you, everybody, that you survived this uh, harrowing two, two hours with us. Uh, oh, thanks. Oh,